Namaskaram. Um, uh, today I'm going to talk about the, um, the central role that ego um, plays in Bhagavan's teachings. Um, in older Advaita texts and commentaries, the, the root problem identified is avidya or maya. But Bhagavan goes a bit deeper. Bhagavan says the root problem is ego. Obviously, Bhagavan is not contradicting what he said in the, um, in the older text, but he's shifting the emphasis. As I say, he's going deeper. And also he's presenting the a greater philosophy, not only in a much simpler and deeper and clearer way, but also in a much more practical way. And what he taught us about ego is, is central to this. That is, um, why he's not contradicting, because it, it is true, uh, avidya or maya is the problem. But for whom is avidya? For whom is maya? It is only for ourselves as ego. Um, avidya is and maya actually the very nature of ego. What does avidya mean? Avidya means ignorance of our real nature. That is the very nature of ego. That is, as Bhagavan explained, ego is the it's that false awareness that is always aware of itself as I am this body. So long as we're aware, since this body is not what we actually are, so long as we are aware of ourselves as I am this body, we are ignorant of what we actually are. So avidya is the very nature of ego. But Rab, but if we talk about avidya, it's, it seems to be something other than ourself. When Bhagavan focuses on who is it who has this avidya, that is ourself as ego. So and, and likewise, maya, maya, it's, it, Maya means, um, well, as Bhagavan explained, uh, uh, Bhagavan gave a very nice um, explanation of Maya. It may not be the original etymology, but he explained it as, as an etymology. That is, uh, Maya means Ya Ma. Ya means, uh, is a feminine form of, uh, of what? And uh, Ma means uh, not. So what is not, or she who is not? That is Maya. So Maya doesn't actually exist. But Maya is a term that is used to refer to all this multiplicity. All this multiplicity is just a delusion. To whom does it all appear? Only to ourself as ego. In, in sleep, when we don't rise as ego, there's no avidya, no Maya, nothing, no problem at all. It's only when we rise as ego in waking and dream that this avidya and Maya and everything comes into existence. Um, here also Bhagavan has slightly, um, his analysis goes slightly deeper than the older text because according to Bhagavan, sleep is not a state of ignorance, it's a state of pure awareness. Ignorance comes into existence only when we rise as ego. Without ego, there's no ignorance. So sleep is just a state of pure awareness. Um, so, uh, the, um, I, I, I will now, um, to illustrate what a central role ego plays in Bhagavan's teachings, I'll, um, I will uh, explain how ego is actually the main topic uh, throughout Uludunapadu. In most of the verses of, of, of Uludunapadu, Bhagavan is either talking explicitly or implicitly about ego. Uh, Bhagavan wrote Uludunapadu um, in answer to uh, the request of Murugana. What Murugana asked Bhagavan, um, this is uh, as he it says it in his, uh, in his Pairam or instructory verse, the, the question he, I mean, what he asked Bhagavan is, mayin ilbum ade mevum tiranum we embody emaku odaha. That means so that we may be saved, reveal to us the nature of reality and the means to attain it, or reach it, or join it. So um, the subject of religion after is the nature of reality and the means by which to attain it. However, though religion after is about uludu, the reality, what actually exists, 
the, what Bhagavan focuses on is the means to attain it. Because why, if, if Uladu is what is, and that is what we actually are, then why do we not experience ourselves as that? So what we need to know is how to attain that. And first, we need to know what is the obstacle and how to overcome that obstacle. The obstacle, as Bhagavan says, is our rising as ego. How to overcome it is what he explains in Uludu Napadu. So uh, Ulu, uh, ego is the, is the central theme running throughout most of the verses of Uludu Napadu. I will, um, before concentrating on verses 23 to 26, which are the uh, central verses dealing with the nature of ego, I will first talk, I will first give a, a brief overview of how Bhagavan is referring to ego either directly or indirectly in most of the verses. In the very first verse, uh, Bhagavan begins, Nam Ulahum Kandalal, because we see the world. So who is that Nam, that we who see the world? That is only ego. It's only when we rise as ego in waking and dream that we see a world. In sleep, when we don't rise as ego, there is no uh, uh, world. So the very first word of the main text of Uludunapatu, Nam, which means we, is referring to ego, ourself as ego. Only when we rise as ego are we, are we seeing the world. So in this first verse, he says, because we see the world, accepting one fundamental that has a power uh, that becomes many is certainly the one best option. The picture of names and forms, the one who sees, the cohesive scream and the pervading light, all these are he who is oneself. So in this second sentence, Parpanam, the one who sees, that is also referring to ego. So in this first verse, Bhagavan is, is, is beginning to touch upon ego. In the next two verses, he um, reveals that aim of Uludunapadu. The aim of Uludunapadu is not just to teach us a philosophy but we can argue with others about. The aim of the Uludunapadu is to get rid of ego, as he implies in these two verses. In verse 2 he says, each religion initially accepts three fundamentals, that is the world, soul and God. And then he says, Contending only one fundamental stands as the three fundamentals, or three fundamentals are always actually three fundamentals, is only so long as ego exists. Destroying I, standing in the state of oneself is best. So here Bhagavan says all, all disputes between different religions and different philosophies and so on, or in fact all disputes, they are only they can take place only so long as the ego as we rise as ego. Therefore, destroying this ego and standing in our natural state, that is the best option. And similarly, in the, uh, in the third verse, he says, what is the use of disputing? The world is real. No, it's an unreal appearance. The world is sentient. It is not. The world is happiness. It is not. Leaving the world and investigating oneself, uh, thereby uh, bringing about the cessation of, uh, of the distinction between one and two, that state in which I has perished is agreeable to all. So again here, he's talking about the, uh, the, ego, the, the, uh, the, the state in which the ego is annihilated. That is what, what we are all indirectly seeking. That is, we're all seeking happiness, and the happiness that we're seeking can be attained only when this ego is annihilated. Um, in verse 4, he begins to um, go uh, deeper. He begins to uh, uh, talk about what the actual problem is. Uh, he begins um, verse 4 by saying, Uruvum tanayin ulhu paramatran. That is, if oneself is a form, the world and God will be likewise. If oneself is not a form, who can see their forms and how? Um, uh, can uh, what is seen be otherwise than the eye? That is, the eye means the, um, he's using eye here, that is E Y E, as a as an analogy for uh, awareness. So, can the what is seen be other than the? Can the nature of what is seen be otherwise than the nature of uh, the seer is the implication. Uh, that is, if the seer is a form, everything that is seen will also seem to be forms. If the seer is formless, everything will be formless. 
And then he concludes by saying, the I, again, E-Y-E, -E, Kun, is oneself the infinite I. What is the, the here, as I say, I mean is an is a metaphor for awareness. So it, it, what this implies is the awareness, uh, the, that is the real awareness, is oneself, the infinite awareness. What is infinite? Forms are all finite. So whatever is infinite is formless. So the, our real nature is formless awareness, and therefore it never sees forms. It's only when we rise as uh, ego and identify ourselves with the form of a body that we see a, the, the world and God as forms. Um, when we don't rise as ego, all forms disappear and only pure infinite awareness remains. So when he says in the uh, first clause, Uruvum uh, Tanayin, if oneself is a form, but what he's referring to is ego, here is ego, because it's only when we rise as ego that we identify ourselves as a form. We experience ourselves as a form of this body only when we've risen as ego. So here he's indirectly referring to ego. In the next verse, because he said ego is the, it's nothing but the false awareness, I am this body, he explains what he means by the term body. This is a very important verse. Uh, that is generally we, when we talk about body, we think about the physical form. But here Bhagavan goes deeper. He says, Udul Panchakosa Udu, the body is a form of five sheaths. Therefore, all five are included in the term body. Um, without a body, is there a world? Say, leaving the body, is there anyone who has seen a world? That is, again, he's emphasizing here, only when we experience ourselves as a body do we see this world of names and forms. So why does he say the body is a form of five sheaths? Um, if we talk about the body objectively, uh, it's just a physical form. But Bhagavan is here talking from the perspective of ego. As ego, we, are, uh, we identify this body as I. But when we identify this body as I, we never identify a dead body as I. It's always a living body as I. So there's not only the, the anamaya kosha, the uh, gross physical form of the body, there's also the pranamaya kosha, the life that animates that body. We also don't ever experience a sleeping body as I. That whenever we experience uh, our health of a body, uh, we seem to be awake. So when we're awake, there's also mind, intellect, and will. So these five, uh, the physical form of the body, anamaya kosha, the life, pranamaya kosha, the mind, manamaya kosha, the uh, intellect, vijnanamaya kosha, and the will, or chittam, the ananda my kosha. These we collectively we experience all these collectively as ourself. So when we say I am a body, we're not refer referring just to the physical form of a body. We're referring to all these five sheaths. And whenever we experience ourselves as a body, in other words, whenever we rise as ego, we experience all five of these. We never experience one or, or, or more without the others. We, we experience them all collectively as ourselves. Uh, so he's here defining what he means by uh, body. And he says that only when we identify, or he implies, only when we identify ourselves with a body do we see a world. In other words, only when we rise as ego, because it's only as ego that we identify ourselves as a body. Um, in verse 6, uh, he says, Uluhu aim pulangol uru verandru. The world is a form of five sense impressions, not anything else. That is what we what we take to be the world. Uh, we 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 uh, we generally believe that there's some world existing outside ourselves that we are perceiving. But what Bhagavan says here is, what we call the world is actually nothing but a collection of five kinds of sense impressions: sights, sounds. Um, uh, tastes, smells, and tactile sensations. Remove these five, and where is any world? So the world, as we, as we know it, is nothing but these five kinds of sense impressions. So these five, I and mean, then he goes on to say, both five sense impressions are impressions to the five sense organs. Since the mind alone perceives the world by way of the five sense organs, say, is there a world besides the mind? What he refers to here as mind 
is ego because as he explains in verse 18 of Upadesha Undia, the term mind is often used as a collective term to refer to all thoughts, all thoughts collectively of a mind. But of all the thoughts that uh, rise in the mind, the root is only the first thought, I. That is the, this, what he refers to there as the thought called I, is what he uh, otherwise refers to as ego. That is ego, it's, it's nothing but a thought, and it's the first of all thoughts. So though, though the term mind is often used as a collective term to, to refer to all the thoughts, what the mind essentially is, is this I. Why is that? Because all other thoughts are objects perceived by us. Whereas ego, the thought called I, is the perceiver. So when he says here, since the mind alone perceives the world, what he's referring to is ego, which is the perceiving element of the mind. It's not other thoughts that perceive the, uh, the world, it's only ego that perceives the world. So here he's saying that the world doesn't exist besides, he said, he asks it as a rhetorical question, is there a world besides the mind? Like in the previous verse, he also asked rhetorical question. The implication is, no, there is no world besides the mind. That is, it's only in the view of the mind that the world seems to exist. The mind here meaning ego. So here also he's referring to ego. Then in verse 7, he uses two terms, uluhu and arivu. Uh, the arivu he's referring to in this verse, arivu means aware, uluhu means the world, arivu means awareness. The awareness he's referring to in this verse is the ego, because he talks about it uh, arising and subsiding, the, the, the world, uh, or appearing and disappearing. The awareness that rises and subsides is only ego. Um, so what he says in this verse is, though the world and awareness rise and subside simultaneously, the world shines by awareness. As I say here, awareness is referring to ego, the perceiver of the world. So th though the world and ego rise and subside simultaneously, the world shines only by ego. It's the implication. Uh, what he means by the world shines only by ego? It's only in the view of ego that world seems to exist. So without ego, there would be no world. But then he said, that, then in the next sentence, he says very nicely, only that which shines without appearing and disappearing as the place for the appearing and disappearing of the world and awareness is the substance, uh, which is the whole. The term he uses here for substance is poro, which is a Tamil equivalent of the Sanskrit word vastu. That means the real substance, what actually exists. So what actually exists, the real substance that uh, appears as all this, is only that which shines without appearing and disappearing as the place or the base for the appearing and disappearing of the world and awareness. What he's referring to here what is it that shines without appearing and disappearing? It is only the fundamental awareness that is always shining in our heart as I am. It is our fundamental awareness of our own existence. In other words, such it. So that, that, that is what he refers to here, is that which shines without ever appearing and disappearing. That is the one thing we are always aware of is I am. Uh, ego and the world appear in waking and dream but disappear in sleep. But even in the absence of ego in sleep, we are still aware of ourselves as I am. So that, that fundamental awareness of our own existence, I am, is that which shines without appearing and disappearing. And as he says, that is poro, that is vastu, that is the, that is the, the meporal, the real substance, what actually exists. And that is uh, pundram. He uses, pundram is a Tamil form of the Sanskrit word purna. It's the infinite whole, the unlimited whole. Um, so that alone is what is real, he points out here. Um, then um, in verse 8, he talks about uh, um, the, uh, whether that substance is uh, the substance that he refers to in verse uh, 7. Is it... Uh, is it uh, a name and form, or is it formless? Well, the fact he says it's the, the indicated, but it's the infinite whole means it's formless. So what he says in this verse is, whoever worships in whatever form, giving whatever name, that is the way to see that substance in name and form. 
the term he uses here for in name and form is per uruvil. Um, we, we can interpret, um, because he says uh, per uruvil ap porole, per uruvil can mean per uruvilada, that means without name and form or nameless and formless. So we could, um, we could interpret uh, it here to be an adjective describing the, the substance, the nameless and formless substance. But it's more appropriate here to, to take the ill to be the locative case ending to mean in name and form. Yes, that, that poddle is nameless and formless, but he's, what he's talking about here is if we worship it in name and form, that's a way to see it in name and form. But that is not the real seeing, because as he says in the next sentence, ayinum, ayinum means however. Uh, investigating the reality of oneself, dissolving in the reality of that true substance, becoming one, uh, becoming one alone is seeing in reality. That is only when we turn our attention within to uh, investigate the reality of ourself and thereby dissolve in that in the reality of that pure uh, that true substance in other words in that pure awareness i am that alone is seeing in reality so uh, he's contrasting in these two sentences in the first sentence he's talking about seeing uh, in name and form in this uh, second sentence he's talking about seeing in reality that is in the first sentence it um it's uh it's uh, peruru vilkan, seeing in name and form. And here it's, uh, uh, it's, uh, he's talking about unmeil kanal, seeing in reality. So this is the contrast here. So he, he, who is it who sees, uh, the, uh, who can see uh, the reality? And it's referring indirectly to God in name and form. It's only as ego that we can see God in name and form, as he said in verse four. But to see him in reality, we as ego need to dissolve, we need to investigate ourselves and thereby dissolve back in to our own reality, which is that real substance, pure awareness, uh, the, the fundamental awareness I am. So here indirectly he's referring to ego here. In verse 9 he again talks about ego more directly. He, he, what he says here is, he talks about dyads and triads. Dyads here means pairs of opposites. That is um, um, existence, non-existence, awareness, non-awareness, uh, happiness, unhappiness, um, knowledge, ignorance, uh, life, death, etc. So all these pairs of opposites uh, they, is what he refers to as dyads. And triads uh, means triputi, the, the three factors of of objective knowledge. Whenever we know something other than ourselves, we are the subject, the, the knower, but what we know is the object, when, what is known, and uh, there's the act of knowing it. So these three, the knower, the knowing, and the known, these uh, are what are called the triputi or triad. So Bhagavan said all these dyads and triads existing, uh, exist always holding one thing, so uh, the word he uses for one thing is ondru. What is that ondru? What is that one thing that, that uh, upon which all these diets and triads depend? It is only ego. That's only as when we rise as ego do diets and triads come into existence. So though he doesn't uh, use the word ego here, it's what he implies. And he explained this very clearly to Lakshman Sharma, who's written it in his Tamil commentary. Um, some people have misinterpreted this verse that one thing is, is the reality. That is not what he means here. That is our re the real self. That, that's not what he's talking here about ego. It's only when we rise as ego that diets and triads come into existence. And it, so in the next sentence, he says, if one sees within the mind what that one thing is, they will cease to exist. So that one thing on which dyads and triads it exists within the mind, that's the mind in a collective sense, that one thing is ego. If we investigate ego, ego will disappear and dyads and triads will cease to exist along with it. That is the implication here. And then he says, only those who have seen, the, uh, who have seen thus have seen the reality. See, they will not be confused. Then in verses 10 to 11, he, uh, sorry, 10 to 13, these four verses, he's talking about, um, he's 
analyzing knowledge uh, about knowledge and ignorance. And uh, indirectly, he's referring to ego here. In um, He says, in, uh, for instance, in verse 10, only the knowledge but knows oneself. Here oneself in this, con uh, only the knowledge but knows oneself who is the first as to whom are that knowledge and ignorance is knowledge. Um, so to whom are knowledge and ignorance? It's only to ego. Knowledge and ignorance are one of the dyads. So to whom are knowledge and ignorance? It's only to ego. So he's indirectly referring to ego. So when he says only the knowledge but knows oneself, he means the knowledge but knows the reality of ego. Only when we only only the awareness that is aware of the reality of ego, that is the pure awareness I am, is real knowledge. He says here in verse ten. In verse eleven, he says, "Not knowing oneself who knows." Here, oneself who knows, Arivaram uh, Tanne uh, refers to ego. It's the ego that knows all other things. So, uh, not knowing oneself who knows, knowing other things is ignorance. Besides, is it knowledge? When one knows oneself, the support for knowledge and yabba, again here, oneself means ego, knowledge and ignorance will cease. Um, in verse 12, he says, what is completely devoid of knowledge and ignorance is actually knowledge. Knowledge here means awareness, it's real awareness. So only the awareness that is devoid of knowledge and ignorance of other things is real awareness. That which knows is not real knowledge. Here he's referring to ego. That which knows means that which knows other things is not real knowledge. That ego is not real knowledge. Since one sh since one shines without another for knowing or causing to know, oneself is is knowledge. Is uh, knowledge here is used in the sense of awareness. So the real awareness is only that which shines without any other for knowing or not knowing. Um, I mean, he says uh, that it is not a void. It is not sunyam. And in verse 13, he, he begins by saying, jnana mam tane me, oneself who is awareness alone is real. Nana vam jnanam agnana mam, knowledge which is manifold or many or various is ignorance. The awareness that is, uh, uh, what he's referring to here, the nana vam jnanam, in an earlier version of this verse, he wrote it as, Nana vai kan kindranyanam, that is the knowledge which sees as many. So, as ego, we see the one real substance as all this multiplicity. So, what he refers to here is as nana vamyanam or nana vai kan kindranyanam is ego. Ego is the false awareness that sees all this, or, or see, that sees the one as all this. So, uh, therefore, ego is ignorance. But then he says, um, the, uh, uh, um, even ignorance, that is, he's referring here to ego as ignorance, even ignorance, which is unreal, does not exist except as oneself, who is awareness. So that even though this ego is ignorance, uh, because ego is, the, is that which is aware of itself as I am this body, and which is therefore aware of the seeming existence of other things, uh, that doesn't exist apart from oneself who is awareness. Oneself who is awareness is a pure awareness I am. So ego cannot exist apart from I am. I mean, he compares it uh, using the analogy of ornaments and gold. All the many ornaments are re unreal. Say, do they exist except as gold, which is real? So what he's asserting here is the substance alone is real. The forms uh, are just uh, are unreal. They're just an appearance. Um, so again, he's referring indirectly to ego here. In the next verse, he talks about ego very explicitly. Though he doesn't use the word ego, he refers to ego as the first person, Tanmai. And he says, if a, what he says here is what he again later says in verse 26, but he says it in a different way here. If the first person exists, second and third persons will exist. Here, first person means ego, the perceiver, the subject. Second and third persons means everything other than, than ego, everything that is perceived by ego. So when he says if, if the first person exists, second and third person will exist. That is, if we rise as the perceiver or subject, then objects will seem to exist. Things that we will seem to, uh, it's only when we rise at this ego, whose nature is to perceive things other than itself, that other things will seem to exist. Then he says, 
if one self investigating the reality of the first person, the first person ceases to exist, second and third persons come, uh, will come to an end, and the nature that then shines as one alone is oneself, the state of oneself. So watch the one thing that shines after the first person and second person cease to, second, third, first, second and third persons all cease to exist. That is uh, what we actually are. So this first, in order to bring about the cessation of the second and third persons, we need to bring about the cessation of the first person, because so long as the first person exists, the second and third persons will exist. So how to bring about the cessation of the first person, the ego? Only by investigating it through the reality of it. So he says, tanmayin uh, unmaye tanandu. So that is oneself investigating the reality of the uh, first person. That is, what is this ego? What actually is this ego? What is the reality underlying this ego? The reality underlying the ego is nothing but the, fun, the pure awareness I am. Ego is the mixed awareness I am this body. The reality of it is only the awareness I am. So I've gone through the first 14 verses now and shown how he's referring to ego in almost every verse. I will not go through each and every verse now because it, it's getting, it'll take too long, but I'll, I'll, I'll skip on now to, um, I mean, indirectly Bhagavan is referring to ego in most of these verses, but now I'll skip on to verse 19. In verse 19, he says, um, in the first sentence, Vidi, that means only for those who do not have discernment of the fate of the root of fate and will is there the dispute about which prevails, fate or will. This is the old uh, the old uh, thing about uh, the dispute between uh, free will and uh, um, and and destiny. Which, which prevails. Bhagavan said this such a dispute is only for those who do not have discernment of the root of fate and will. So what is the root of fate and will? It is only, though he doesn't explicitly say it here, it implies ego because it's only when we rise as ego but we have a will and uh, we, we like this and dislike that and we try to attain all the things we like and to avoid the things we dislike. So we act according to our will. But we, what we experience is our destiny. The, the, the fruit of our misuse of our will in previous lives is what we now experience. So our will and our, uh, the will and fate are both only for ego. It is ego, but does agamya. Agamya means actions that we do by our own will. Um, uh, but, uh, and what we experience for prarabdha, that is the fruit of those actions. So which prevail? Neither prevails over the other because they're two entirely separate domains. Will is what, that is, fate cannot make us want anything that we don't but, but we don't want we 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 are uh, and uh, that is what we want is not going to we can want to experience anything but it's not going to change what we are to experience because what we are to experience is determined by fate but just because we are destined to experience something doesn't stop us wanting to experience something else so uh, the the the, the domain of will is what we want to experience. The domain of fate is what we are to experience. These are two separate domains. So neither can intrude into the domain of the other. Fate cannot make us want anything that we don't want. And will cannot, our will cannot change what we are destined to experience. So, but the root of both of these, for whom I, who is it who has this will? Who is it who is experiencing this fate? It is only I as ego. So he's referring here to ego. So he then goes on to say, those who have known themselves, who is the one origin of fate and will, have discarded them. The one origin for fate and will, again, here he's using the term muddle, meaning origin. It can also mean root. Um, again, it is ego. When we know the reality of ego, we thereby free ourselves from ego and thereby discard both fate and will. 
say, will they thereafter be associated with them? So here Bhagavan is very uh, clearly, like in all, all these verses, Bhagavan is constantly stressing that ego is the root of all these things. The root of knowledge and ignorance, of, uh, of fate and will, uh, of uh, perception of world, it's, it's the root of everything. Um, then in, um, in verse 20, he says, um, he, in the verse 20, 21 and 22, he, is this, the subject is about seeing God. And he begins by saying, uh, Kanam tane bittu, leaving oneself who sees. Oneself who sees means ego. So leaving oneself who sees, oneself seeing God is seeing a mental uh, vision. A manamaya maam uh, Leaving oneself here means uh, ignoring oneself. In, in other words, instead of trying to see what oneself is, trying to see God, uh, and even if one succeeds in seeing God, one's seeing only a mental vision. And then he says, only one who sees oneself, the origin of oneself, is one who has seen God. Because the origin oneself going, oneself is not other than God. Here Bhagavan is using the word, uh, the Tamil word tan, which means oneself. But he's using it both to refer to ourself as we actually are and ourself as ego. So we need to understand when he says, only one who sees oneself, he's meaning what we actually are. Then he, he refers to oneself as the origin of oneself. That means the origin of ego. So only, one, only one who sees one's real nature, the origin of ego, is one who has seen God, is the implication. Because uh, uh, the origin, that, uh, that's our real nature. No, sorry, because, because e ego, um, which is the origin of everything else, um, going, once. Uh, uh, when ego goes, um, uh, oneself is not other than God. So it's a, it's a complicated sentence, but it's actually very, very uh, deep in meaning. Um, so we, we need to understand which, uh, when he's referring to our real nature and when he's referring to ego. So this verse is about ego. That is, uh, he's identifying here that the problem is ego. Likewise, in the next uh, verse, he says, if one, if one asks the truth of what is the truth of many texts that say oneself seeing oneself and seeing God. So you know, if, if one asks what is the truth of, the, of many texts that say oneself seeing oneself and seeing God, uh, he then gives the answer to that. Uh, since oneself is one, how is oneself to see oneself? If it is not possible to see oneself, how to see God? Then he provides the answer, Unadal Khan. Unadal Khan means becoming food is seeing. Becoming food here means only when the ego is swallowed by God, is what it implies. So only when we, who is it who wants to see God? It is only as ego that we want to see God. But if we want to see God, we have to be swallowed by God. Only when we are swallowed by God and thereby become one with God, are we really seeing God because God is nothing other than our real nature. But we cannot see God as he actually is, so long as we take ourselves to be, so long as we rise as ego and thereby take ourselves to be this body. So in all these verses, he's indirectly referring to ego. And in the next verse, he uses the word mati. Mati here refers to the mind or ego. He, in verse 19, he used mati in the sense of will, but here he's using mati in the sense of more generally of mind, and um, particularly in the sense of ego, uh, because as I said, ego is the perceiving element of the mind. So what the mind essentially is, is ego. So what he says in this verse is, um, it's a very beautiful verse, mati koli tandu, uh, uh, am mati kul olirum, mati ine ulle matiki, Patiel, Padutidital Andri, Patie, Patial, Padutidital Engan, Mati. What that means is consider, except by turning the mind back within, completely immersing it in Pati. Pati means God or the Lord, who shines within that mind, giving light to the mind, how to fathom God by the mind. 
So Pati, as I say, it means, it, it, it's a term that means, it refers to God or the Lord, but he said that it, it is that which shines within the mind, giving light to the mind. In other words, he's referring to our real nature, the pure awareness I am. So what illumines the ego is only, the ego is a mixed awareness, I am this body. What illumines uh, the ego and enables it to know other things is only the light of pure awareness, which is what shines in it as I. So in order to, to know uh, uh, this, uh, to know God, we need to turn our mind back within and drown ourselves in that. In other words, we need to be swallowed by God. Then only we are truly knowing God. Then from 23 to 26, Bhagavan talks about, um, about the nature of ego. I'll come to these verses uh, after going through the later, some of the later, a few of the later verses. Um, uh, because these are, these are the heart of uh, Bhagavan teaching. In verse um, 27, uh, Bhagavan says, Nadnu diyada ulla nilay, na madhuvai ulla nilay. Uh, no, that means the state um, in which one exists without rising as I is the state in which we exist as that. In other words, in order to be aware of ourselves as I am Brahman, we need to uh, avoid rising as I. In other words, the I, uh, that is, the I that rises is ego. So it's only, only when we cease rising as ego are we in the state in which we are that. And then he says, without place, investigating the place where I rises, that means the place where ego rises. From where does ego rise? It rises only from ourself, our real nature. So without investigating that place, here he's using place obviously in a metaphorical sense, not in a literal sense. So without investigating the source, we can say, from which I rises, in other words, the pure awareness that we actually are, how to reach the annihilation of oneself in which I does not rise. Here oneself means ego. So how to, how to bring about the annihilation of ego unless we investigate the source from which ego rises. The source from which ego rises is only the fundamental awareness I am. And then he uh, says in lessons, without reaching, say, how to stand in the state of oneself in which oneself is that. So merely by saying I am that, we, we can't experience ourselves as Brahman. We can't, by saying I am Brahman, we don't experience ourselves as Brahman. In order to experience ourselves as Brahman, we need to bring about the cessation of the rising of ego. And in order to bring about the cessation of the rising of ego, we need to investigate ourselves. Because only when we investigate ourselves does ego subs uh, subside and dissolve forever in its source. Uh, we can bring about the permanent dissolution of ego, in other words, manonasa, the destruction of ego, annihilation or eradication of ego, only by self-investigation is what he implies here. Um, in verse uh, 28, he, he uh, says, like sinking, wanting to know something, that, to, to see something that has fallen in water, sinking within, Restraining speech and breath by a sharpened mind, Kondamati, it is necessary to know the place where the rising ego rises. Again, here he's using the term place uh, metaphorically uh, to mean the source or the, the, uh, the, the, the source from which ego rises is only the pure awareness. So, uh, how do we restrain the speech and breath? Only by a sharpened, by a Kondamati. The, this kundamati is the instrument by which we turn within to investigate and know what we actually are. That same sharpened mind will bring about the restraint of speech and breath. So it's not necessary to uh, restrain the speech and breath separately. If we turn our mind keenly within to know what we actually are, to know the source from which this ego has risen, speech and breath are thereby automatically restrained. So here also he's talking about, he, well, he's explicitly talking about ego here. He says, uh, Erumba Mahande, the rising ego, Erumba Mahande, Eramidate, uh, the place or source from which the rising ego rises. That is what we need to know. And in verse 29, he says, um, again, he's talking, in all these verses, he's talking about the practice, not saying I by mouth, investigating with an inward sinking mind, mind here means the uh, power of attention, where 
one raises as I alone is ber jnana neri, the path of knowledge. Instead, thinking not that uh, I am not this, I am that, is an aid, but is it vichara? No, it's not, is the implication. Um, and then in verse 30, he says, um, as soon as the mind reaches the heart, inwardly investigating who am I, when he who is I dies, he who is I means ego, when ego dies, one thing appears spontaneously as I am I. Though it appears, it is not I, uh, ego, uh, ego uh, right, uh, I but appears and disappears. It is the, uh, it is the entire substance, the substance that is oneself. Again, here he's using the word, Pundra Porul, the substance that is the, is the whole, the infinite whole. And he said, Tanam Porul, the substance that is oneself. That is what we actually are. Um, in verse 30, he talks, uh, 31, sorry, that was 30. He says, he talks about Tane uh, Aritu, the destruction of oneself or destroying oneself. Oneself here obviously means the ego. So what he says in this verse is, for those who are tanmayananda, happiness composed of that, which rose destroying themselves, what one thing exists for doing? They do not know anything other than themselves. So who can uh, conceive their status like this? So again, here he's referring, only when the ego is destroyed, do we experience tammayananda, uh, happiness, which is our own real nature? Um, and other verses, he, he also touches upon ego here and there, but I won't go through them in detail until verse 30, 38. He, in verse 38, he says, um, uh, Vine mudal nam ayin, vile payan tulpong. If we are the doer of actions, we would experience the resulting fruit. So who is the doer of actions? It is only ego. Why? Because all actions, are, all karma is done by mind, speech, and body. These are the three instruments of action. So long as we rise as ego, we experience this mind and body as ourself. So whatever actions are done by the mind, speech, or body, we experience them as actions done by me. So these are, um, these are, uh, the, the doer of action is ego. That is, ego is because as ego we identify ourselves with the instruments of action. We experience the actions that are done by ourselves. So, so long as we, when he says, if we have a doer of action, he implies if we, if we rise as ego, uh, we we will we will inevitably do actions according to our will, and consequently we will experience the fruit. That is the implication there. And then he says, when one knows oneself by investigating who is the doer of action, doership will depart and all three actions will slip off. What this means is when we investigate ourselves to find out who is the doer of action, in other words, who am I, this ego who rises as I am a doer, uh, when the nature of ego is such, when we investigate it, it subsides and disappears. Then we know our real nature. And when we know our real nature, we will know that we were never the doer of any action. So doership will depart. And along with doership, obviously, experiencership, because it's only as ego that we experience ourselves as I am a doer, and I am the experiencer of fruit. It's fruit. So doership will depart, and all three karmas, that is, uh, agamya, actions done by our will, sanchita, the fruit of those, store of the fruit of those actions, and prarabdha, those actions, the, the fruit would have been a lot of for us to experience in this lifetime, all will slip off. That means all three karmas will be uh, destroyed. This is the state of liberation, which is eternal. So here, Bhagavan is, is clearly talking about ego. In the next verse also, oh, he, he says, um, um, uh, Bhattanan in the mate, only so long as one is aware of oneself as I am bound. So only so long as one says, I am bound, thoughts of bondage and liberation exist. When one looks at oneself, who is the one who is bound, in other words, when one looks at ego, who is the one who is bound, uh, and when oneself, then oneself, the, the one who is eternally liberated, remains as accomplished, uh, thought of bondage will not remain, so thought of liberation will also not remain.
So again, indirectly, he's referring here to ego as the one who is bound. And if we investigate this one who is bound, it will disappear. And what will remain is our own real nature, which is eternally liberated. And then uh, he's referred there to liberate. I mean, he refers in both these uh, 38 and 39 to the state of liberation. So in 40, he says, what is liberation? That is the term mukti or liberation or moksha is used in, in almost all systems of Indian philosophy, but, and, uh, or well, Indian religion also. But what is mukti? There are so many different ideas people have. Some people think in the state of mukti, you still retain your individuality. You're in Vaikuntha or Kailasa with uh, Vishnu or Shiva or wherever, and uh, you still remain as having a form. So some people think liberation is a state in which you retain form. Some people think liberation is a formless state. And some people think that in the state of liberation, you're free to either take a form or to leave a form. So these are three types of liberation, with form, without form, or with or without form. So Bhagavan refers to this and he says, if it is said that the liberation one will experience is of three kinds, uh, with form, without form, or with or without form, I will say, um, he, he gives his verdict. Uh, 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 his verdict is uh, Uruvum, Aruvum, Uruvaruvum. That is with form, without form, or without form, Ayo Mahande, Uru, Aridal, Mukti. That is, uh, know that um, uh, de destruction of the ego, which distinguishes. Uh, liberation with form, without form, or with or without form, that alone is real liberation. In other words, in Bhagavan's the conclusion of ego of Ulidunaptu is that only annihilation of ego is liberation. So, as I've explained, uh, he's talking about ego throughout all these verses. Um, but, but the verses in which he deals with the nature of ego most explicitly is in verses 23 to 26. Um, but I see, I seem to be, um, I may be running over my time a little. I will quickly go through these verses and then I hope I'll be able to leave a little time for, um, for questions and answers. Um, what he says in verse 23 is, um, Uh, uh, um, uh, uh, or, or not, sorry, Nan Andrew Ideham Nabiladu. This body does not say I. Though he says say here, he's using say in a metaphorical sense. That is what he implies is the body is not aware of itself as I. And here, what he refers to as body is not just this physical form. All the five sheaves, none of the five sheaves are aware of themselves as I. Uh, so uh, this body does not say I. Urukatum uh, nan uh, indru indru arum nabil nabil vadu ille. That is, uh, no one says in sleep I did not exist. That is, even though the ego was absent in sleep, we are clearly aware that we existed in sleep. Uh, that's the implication here. Uh, then he says, Nan Ondru Arindupin Elam Erum. After one thing called I, namely ego, rises, everything rises. Um, and then his conclusion is, um, In Danan Engu Erum Endru Nun Matyal En. Therefore, investigate with a keen uh, or a subtle intellect, a sharp, uh, that means a keen power of attention, uh, uh, where this ego rises. Um, in, in, the Uli, in, in the Kali Vemba version of this verse, he extends this sentence and he says, when one investigates where this, e where this sharp mind, where this ego rises, it will, uh, it will slip off. Um, then in verse 24, he says similarly, Jada Udal Nan Enadu, this uh, this insentient body 
does not say I. That in other words, the body is not aware of itself as I. Satchit udiyadu. Satchit means uh, being awareness or real awareness. It's referring to where, uh, our awareness of our own existence, I am. So satchit udiyadu does not rise. So the, the body does, is not aware of itself as I, and satchit doesn't rise. Ideal, uh, sorry, uh, udal uh, alava nan ondru uh, udikum ideal. That means in between uh, one thing, uh, I rises as the extent of a body. That the in between here means in between the body and satchit. Obviously, the body and satchit are not two different things because satchit is the only real substance. The body cannot exist independent of satchit. So there's no space between satchit and uh, the body for ego to rise. So he's using ideal in between here in a metaphorical sense. Why he uses this term ideal? Because what the eye that rises between, um, in between the body and satchit is ego. Ego, uh, ego uh, partakes of the uh, qualities of the body and the qualities of satchit. It usurps the qualities of both. So he, here in between means it is, it is borrowing from both of them. It is, neither, it is neither the body nor is it satchit, but it borrows the uh, qualities of both. Um, so so he, that's what he means by ideal. It's neither this nor that, but something in between. Um, it, it's a metaphorical use, in other words. So that what is this this one thing I that rises between the, uh, the body that rises as the extent of the body as the extent of the body means this I that rises it limits itself to the extent of the body that is though it it's it borrows awareness from satchit but it is aware of itself what not just as, as I am but as I am this body so it it's limited to the extent of the body which is what he means by udalalaba. Uh, is it udalalaba um, uh, It rises at the extent of the body. Um, so, what is this I? He says in the next sentence, idu. This, or, or that is uh, idu chitjadagranti. This is the knot uh, 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 formed by the entanglement of chit and jada. That is, the body is jada. Satchit is chit, is pure awareness. When these two are seemingly entangled together as I am this body, that is called chit jadagranti, the knot that binds uh, awareness and uh, uh, what is jada, or but, uh, but, but is formed by the entanglement of these two. Of course, uh, chit is never bound, but uh, this knot is formed when they, they, they seem to be entangled. It's also bandham, uh, bondage. Jivan, the soul of a, a individual, nupame, the subtle body, ahande, ego, ichamsara, this samsara, and manam. So the ego is this false eye. It's neither the body nor is it satchit. It's that which rises in between, taking the taking on taking the awareness of satchit and the limitations of the body and combining it together. This is the nature of ego. It's what he says here. Then in verse 25, he describes ego as Uruvatrapeya Hande, the formless phantom ego. It's formless because it has no form of its own. That is, it's not the body. And it's 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 a phantom because it's got no substance of its own. It's not such it. It's neither the form nor the substance, but some spurious thing that arises between the two. So he describes it as a formless phantom ego. So how did this formless phantom ego come into existence? Well, he doesn't exactly say how it comes into existence. He describes what happens when it comes into existence and how it, uh, how it sustains itself. He says, Uru Patriyundam, grasping form, it comes into existence. That means grasping the form of a body. Uh, uh, as itself, it comes into existence. Uh, Urupatri Nikkam, grasping uh, a form, it stands. That is only by taking this body to the eye and thereby uh, feeding on, uh, 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 grasping other forms, uh, being, in other words, being aware of other forms, it, uh, right, it, it stands. Urupatri uh, Undu Mika Ongum, 
grasping and feeding on forms, it flourishes abundantly. Uru vittu uru patram. Leaving one form, it grasps another form. So the very nature of ego is to grasp form. Tedinal otum pidicum. That means if sought, it takes flight. Why is this? Because ego cannot stand without grasping a, a, a form as itself. If it tries to grasp itself, instead of grasping any form, if it tries to grasp itself, since it is a formless phantom, when it tries to grasp itself, it subsides and disappears. That's what he means by Tedinal uh, Otum uh, Pidicum. This is the, uh, I said at the beginning, what Bhagavan puts emphasis on the ego, and it is a, this is a very practical. This is the practical um, significance of why Bhagavan puts so much stress on ego. Because in this verse, he reveals what is the nature of ego. Ego uh, rises, stands, and flourishes only by grasping form. It itself is formless. So forms are all things other than itself. That means by attending to anything other than itself, ego comes into existence, stands, and flourishes. But if it tries to attend to itself, if it tries to seek itself or grasp itself, it will subside and disappear. This is, this is something that, as far as I'm aware, you, you can search all the, the vast ocean of Advaitic texts that existed before Bhagavan, and you will not find it said so clearly, but the nature of ego is to rise by grasping other things and stand and flourish by grasping other things, but to subside and disappear by grasping itself. In other words, the nature of ego is such, we seem to be ego so long as we're attending to other things. When we try to turn our attention back towards ourselves, this ego begins to dissolve and will subside back into and dissolve back into its source. This is the practical, the, the key to all of Bhagavan's teachings. If we understand this, we, we, all of Bhagavan's teachings fall into place. This is the most important uh, clue he's given us. So this is why self-investigation is the only way to get rid of ego, because so long as we attend to anything other than ourself, we are nourishing and sustaining ego. Only when we attend to ourself are we bringing about the dissolution of ego. So in this verse, he says, the ego comes into existence grasping form. But does that mean that the forms exist there before ego comes into existence? No. We grasp form, we project and grasp the form. Because as he says in verse 26, a hande undain and eight undam. If ego comes into existence, everything comes into existence. That means the forms, all phenomena, they come into existence only when we rise as ego. A hande indrail, indru and If ego doesn't exist, everything doesn't exist. A hande yavamam. Ego itself is everything. Adalal yadu idu endru nadale ovadal yavam in all. Therefore, uh, in investigating what this is is, give, uh, is giving up everything. Why is it giving up everything? Because everything depends for its seeming existence upon ego. When we investigate ego, ego will take in our lotum pritikon. When sought, it takes flight. Ego will, uh, disappears as soon as we investigate, or if we investigate it keenly enough, it will dissolve back into its source, and thereby we are giving up everything. So only to the extent to which we are willing to let go of everything else will we be able to turn our attention back within to uh, investigate this ego. And only when we, when we are willing to let go of everything in other words, when we're willing to surrender ourselves completely, will we finally be able to turn the full 180 degrees to face ourselves alone and thereby dissolve back into our source? So well, throughout all of the Bhagavan is talking about ego. He, and he reveals the nature of ego is such that it rises and flourishes by attending to things other than itself. And, but it, it, it subsides and dissolves back into its source by attending to itself. So this is the means Murana asks, um, may in ilbum adu maven tyrannum, and what is the nature of reality and the means of attaining it? This is the means of attaining it. So the uh, whole of Ulnapnu is an exposition on the nature of ego and the means to get rid of ego.
And it, 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 it's identifying ego throughout the Bhagavan is constantly identifying the root of all problems, whatever the problem may be, whether it's knowledge and ignorance or faith and will or uh, perception of the world or anything, the root of all these problems is only ego. So um, I've talked for a full hour now, I'm afraid. Um, I don't know whether there's, we are able to leave any time for questions or not. Uh Mr. James, we uh, we already have uh, three questions for you in the chat box coming yes. in from Miraji and uh, Rashmiji. Uh, okay. Uh, may I request you to take them uh, while if any more questions come, you could also take them. Uh, okay, certainly. I will have one. Um, uh, sorry, it's a little difficult for me to read. Um, I, I think it's Neera asked, you mention I thought as the perceiver aspect of the mind. Is this um, the, sat the sattvic aspect of the mind? How, how do we uh, know when we're able to trace our thoughts to the I thought? Um, that is, when, when I said the I thought is the perceiving aspect of the mind, that is, all other thoughts are objects perceived by us. The ego, or thought called I, as Bhagavan often referred to it, is the thought that is aware of all other thoughts. In other words, it's the thought that perceives all other thoughts. So in that, this sense, it is the uh, perceiver aspect of the mind. The sattvic aspect of the mind is slightly different. What the mind essentially is, the mind or ego, what it essentially is, is just the pure awareness I am. What sattva means, sat means existence. Sattva means the existence-ness, or in other words, the beingness. In other words, the, 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 it's, the, it's the essential being nature of the mind. So the sattvic aspect of the mind is the pure awareness, I am this body. Uh, sorry, the, the pure awareness, I am. Ego, or the thought called I, is the mixed awareness, I am this body. So in that, in that, in the I thought or ego, the, the, the essential I am aspect, that is the sattvic aspect of the mind. When we, when we attach ourselves to adjuncts and thereby uh, allow our attention to go outwards, that's how rajas and tamas comes into existence. That is, the tamas is, is when we take ourselves to be the body, that is tamas, because we are, we are covering, we are, con tamas means darkness. So we are, Metaphorically speaking, we are concealing. Though we're always aware of ourselves as I am, we're not aware of ourselves as we are not aware of what I, we are aware that I am, but we're not aware what I am because we now mistake ourselves to be I am this body. So this I am this body that is tamas, and that leads to all mental activity, which is rajas. So the essential sattvic aspect of the mind is only that pure awareness I am. That is what we need to hold on to. Um, and you ask, how do we, how do we know when we're able to trace our thoughts to the I thought? That is, it, this is not a difficult thing. We we are aware whatever whatever thought other thoughts arise, who is aware of it? I am aware of it. So we have traced it back to I. It, once we've traced it back to I, we have to hold on to this I. When we hold on to this eye, Bhagavan said holding on to ego is like the, the, the master, like a dog holding on to the scent of its master. The master may be some far, may be far away, but the dog just holds on to the scent. And by following the scent, it's able to reach its master. So this ego, it, it, in this ego, there is the, I, the awareness I am. That is the scent. If we hold on to this I am, it will lead us back to our source, the pure I am. So we are it, the, tracing the other thoughts to ego, to I thought, is very easy because we just have to uh, just have to think a little. Yes, to whom is this? It's to me. That is tracing it back to ego. But then we have to trace this ego back to its source. How do we trace the ego back to its source? By attending only to ego. The more we attend to ego, the more it subsides. The more it subsides, the closer we come to returning back to our source. So that is our aim, to return to, not to, 
the, the ego we know already, <laughs> the ego is bouncing around as I am, I am Michael or I am Nero or wh whoever we take ourselves to be, that is ego. So finding ego is not difficult. We need to hold on to this ego and it will lead us back to our source. In other words, we need to pierce through this ego back to the, to the reality that lies behind ego, which is this the pure awareness I am. We're always aware of that pure awareness I am. So there's nothing new to know. As Bhagavan said, attaining jnana is not a new knowledge. Uh, all we need to do is to get rid of the ajnana, get rid of the false knowledge. The false knowledge, the ajnana or avidya, is nothing but this uh, false awareness, I am this body. Remove the adjunct, and what remains? The, the adjunct is this body. What remains is the pure awareness, I am. That's why Bhagavan says in Upadesh Undia, in verse 25 of Upadesh Undia, he says, um, uh, uh, Tane upadi bitu ovdu, tan isan tane unuvadam, tane unuvadal. That is, uh, knowing one's, oneself, uh, uh, leaving adjuncts, that is, we know ourselves without adjuncts, that itself is knowing God. God is that which shines within us as, as I am. So all we need to do is to remove the adjuncts and uh, uh, what remains is the pure I am. So uh, our, our task is not tracing anything back. I mean, thoughts should turn our, whenever thoughts arise, we should, we should, uh, they should remind us to whom are these thoughts rising to me? In other words, we bring our attention back to ourselves. Then we have to hold our attention on ourselves. Because only by being self-attentive do we bring about the subsidence of ego and thereby trace our way back to our source, which is that pure awareness I am. In other words, the more we hold on to the essential chit aspect of ego, as Bhagavan said, in other words, the, the more we hold on to I am, the more we, the adjuncts drop off and we thereby return to and merge back into our source, which is that pure awareness I am. So I hope that adequately answers that question. And um, then, uh, okay, and then Nira's asked again, uh, when we trace our thoughts to the I thought, is this the state of the perceiver of, who perceives thoughts without involvement? No, we don't, this is, this is some people in, in older texts, the perceiver, in our words, ego, is often referred to as sakshi. Sakshi means that which is a witness, in other words, that which is aware of all this, that is ego. Some people think, oh, it, but, but it said that Atman is the sakshi. Atman here is referring to ego. Oh, sometimes when it, our real nature is referred to as ego, Bhagavan said that doesn't mean our real nature perceives all this. It means our real nature is the sanity, the presence in which all this appears. But generally, when it's when we're talking about witness as the perceiver, it's that's referring to ego. So if you, so long as we are uh, um, perceiving thoughts, we are involved with them. Thoughts don't uh, appear of their own accord. They we, we are aware of thoughts because we attend to them. So we're already involved in them. If we want to avoid being involved in thoughts, we should stop attending to the thoughts. We need to attend to the perceiver of thoughts, in other words, to ego. So we, our aim is not to attend to thoughts without involvement, because that's impractical. Because attending to thoughts means we're already involved in them. If we want to not be involved in thoughts, we need to so to speak, turn our back on them. We need to turn our attention away from the thought, back towards ourself, the perceiver of the thoughts. Um, or is it just the perceiver without thought? That is, yes, our aim is we need to, we need to ignore all thoughts. We need to turn our attention away from thoughts by turning it back towards ourself, the perceiver. So when we investigate who am I, we are turning our attention away from the thoughts back towards ourselves, the I who perceives them. But that doesn't mean we continue perceiving them. We, by turning our attention back towards ourselves, we, we, we 
thereby ignore the thought and focus our attention only on I, and thereby bring about the subsidence of ego. And then Rashmi has asked, what does he say about the state of body and mind in the medical unconscious condition? That is, like sleep, a, any state in which uh, we are not aware of phenomena, as in, uh, as in coma, uh, brought about, I mean, you can be in a coma either because of, uh, uh, of anesthesia or if you're involved in a car accident, you have a head injury, you may be in coma. Any state in which we are not aware of phenomena is a state of manolea. That is a state like sleep. In that state, though we are not aware of any phenomena, we always remain aware of I am, because I am is the eternal reality. So what is always shining is this fundamental I, awareness I am. In waking, we're aware of ourselves as I am. In dream, we're aware of ourselves as I am. In sleep, we're aware of ourselves as I am. In coma, we're aware of ourselves as I am. When we're under general anesthesia, we're aware of ourselves as I am. Because the, the fundamental awareness I am is the immutable and imperishable reality. That is the poro, that is the vastu, that is the brahman. So we, we never cease to be aware I am. But the difference between waking and dream and, dream, and any state of manolaya, in manolaya, ego doesn't rise, and so only pure awareness, the pure awareness I am remain. In waking and dream, ego rises. So instead of being aware of ourselves just as I am, we're aware of ourselves as I am this body. So the, the medical unconscious condition is just a state of manolea. It's just a temporary dissolution of mind. But we can't thereby, to bring about, we, we um, bringing about a temporary dissolution doesn't solve our problem because mind keeps, the ego keeps on rising again. We need to uh, eradicate ego. In order to eradicate ego, here and now in the waking state, we need to see ourselves as we actually are. In the waking or dream state, we need to see ourselves as we actually are. Then only ego will be eradicated and will never rise again. The difference between Manolea and Manonasa, as Bhagavan pointed out in verse 13 of uh, Upadeshundia, uh, from Manolea, the ego will rise again. Manonasa, it doesn't rise, it never rises again. So uh, once again, sir, uh, thank you for a very insightful and deep talk on the sensitive topic of ego. Yes. Uh, I'm sure yes. it would have stirred enough yes. and more amongst yes. uh, perhaps all of us. Yes. This Wonderful. is the very core of Bhagavan's teachings. Absolutely, sir. Absolutely. <laughs> Absolutely. I would not be surprised if there is a request from the devotees for a follow-up uh, discussion on this topic in the next few weeks. Yeah, yeah. We can go into it a bit more deeply because this is the, this is the very heart of Bhagavan's teachings.